can open them up to uh, Ephesians, or if you've got uh, them electronically, you can click on over and get there. The book of Ephesians, uh, we're going to be on, in chapter 1. And really, this is, the book's like, some of Ephesians is one of the prison letters. So it's a letter that Paul wrote to a church that he had helped start from when he was in prison. Oh, by the way, kids, uh, there's some coloring <laughs> stuff there. Prison. Prison kids. No, not prison kids. Sorry, Dave. Dave's more ADD than me. Kids, there's some coloring stuff and crayons and, and things like that at the back. And if you bring back the crayons, not your colored in stuff, if you bring back the crayons, you'll get a, a little chalky afterwards. Okay. We've got some stuff there. We're not going to do prison ministry with the kids, no. Sorry. Timing is everything. <laughs> kids ministry will be starting soon, though. <laughs> All right, let's, let's start again. Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, and so Paul writes this letter and he's, he's writing to a church that he knows. He's writing to a church that, that as I said, he helped start and really started forming this thing um, in, in the city of Ephesus at that time. And Paul opens his letter by addressing it to God's holy people. And it's just such an amazing thing. What a greeting he has for us as, as the church. He says, he says it in verse 1, to God's holy people in Ephesus. And, and to be holy means to be set apart. It doesn't mean to be better than anything else. It doesn't, it's, it's not holier than thou. It's not to be, Afrikaans has got a beautiful word for it, skeinheilig, to be shine holy. That's, that's not what it, we don't want to be shine holy. But we are holy people. We are God's holy people, friends. We are set apart in that we are God's and we belong to Him. This is who we are as the church. This is who we are as, as a biblical community, as a, as a community that must live out this life of God. And so we're going to read six verses uh, in chapter 1 of, of Ephesians from, from 17 to 23. And then I'll just go through what, what I feel God's got for us this morning. So from verse 17... I keep, this is Paul writing, uh, the NIV title, it is Thanksgiving and Prayer, and he says, I keep asking, and it's just such a beautiful thing there, like this, here's this apostle, and you would think, like, God answers apostles' prayers, you know, when you reach, sort of, the apostleship level, that God answers those prayers, but it's not, there is no, like, higher level, Paul's not, again, shine holy, he's not higher, holier than anybody else, he keeps asking, he keeps asking. He keeps petitioning God. Friends, sometimes we have to persevere in prayer to find the life of God. You know, when you dig a well, I remember at, uh, at the place I was working at in Rustenburg, we had to dig a, a, um, a borehole at my boss's house. And he lived up on the hill behind the, the, the one main shopping mall in Rustenburg. And, and we went down far enough that we were below where the mall was a couple of k's away. And it was about, I think we went down 136 meters for that borehole. Now, if you bored that deep in Monzi, you'd probably be close to the sea. You'd be getting out salt water out of that thing. But we had to keep the, and, and the borehole operator, he, he got to like 60, 70 meters, and he's going, mm, and we're just getting this fine white powder. It's like granite that they were drilling through. And he's going, mm, this is not great. We, and you've got to pay for every meter you drill. You pay whether you hit water or not. But we have to keep going. And sometimes it's like that in our lives, friends. We have to keep asking God. We have to persevere in prayer. We need perseverance to live in biblical community. I don't know if you've ever tried to live with other people, but it can be tough sometimes. <laughs> because they are not as holy as we are. <laughs> yeah? Have you ever done life with someone? Man, it can be tough. But what Paul is saying is, is and it's the same as in, in Luke, chapter, um, Luke chapter 18, verses 1 to 8, of the, this parable with the, the woman who keeps petitioning the judge. Jesus tells this parable about this woman who keeps petitioning the judge, keeps asking for, for justice. And the judge says, oh, just because you keep asking me, I'm going to give it to you. And he says, man, isn't God so much better, I'm such a much better father than this unrighteous judge? And you keep asking him, he'll give you good things. He'll give you the Holy Spirit. And so Paul says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. And it's a beautiful thing that Paul points out this, points out this 
triune God, God the Father of Jesus, to give you the Spirit. That's what he's asking for. It starts, biblical community starts with God. God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It doesn't start with us. It doesn't start with you and I. Because I'm going to miff you off at some stage and you're going to offend me. And, and when, we, when that's where we relate and that's the level we're at, we're, we're eventually going to drift apart and we're going to find reasons to not be there. But when we are centered around God, then we can get over those things and get past them. And what Paul is saying is, Paul is, it's interesting here because Paul is not asking God to send the Holy Spirit to the church in Ephesus. In, in Acts chapter 19, we read pretty much the whole of chapter 19 is about Paul going to Ephesus. And so he goes down there and he, he finds these believers in Ephesus. And it was probably about 12 or so disciples that he found there. And he says to them, have you received the Holy Spirit? And they say, well, we don't even know there's a Holy Spirit. What are you talking about? And so Paul says, okay, he says, well, what baptism did you receive? They said, oh, we got John's baptism. John the Baptizer. He wasn't Baptist as in like Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian. He was John, John the Baptizer, and, and they received that. And Paul, Paul says to them, well, John's baptism is a, is a baptism of repentance. And, and so he baptizes them in the name of Jesus and prays for them, and they receive the Holy Spirit. And so we see from Acts 19 that while Paul was there, and he stayed there for about three years in Ephesus when that church started. And we see that, that so they already have the Holy Spirit. It's not like this is a new prayer where God's saying, Hey, I want you to, Paul's saying, you know, I want you to receive the Spirit. He's saying, I want you to receive this more of the Spirit. I want you to receive the Spirit in a way that you have never experienced it. Maybe you've been to church. Maybe you've had some experience of God. Maybe you've tasted something of, of the life of God in biblical community. My prayer for you this morning is that you would experience that in a new and a fresh way. That God would open up your eyes through the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you can know God better. That's what Paul's prayer is. I keep asking that you receive the spirit so that you may know him better. It centers around God. What we already have is experienced in different ways in biblical community. What we already have is experienced in different ways in biblical communities. When we come together, God does something different than what He would do if we were on our own. We are more than the sum of our parts as we come together, centered around the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When we bring what we have, our time, our talents, our treasures, our gifts, who you are, when we bring those things in biblical community, God does something far more than what I could ever do on my own. When we come and we pray with somebody centered around God and we gather together as a community to pray for that person, I don't know why, but God does something more than what I could do on my own if we each individually pray for them. I do know why. Psalm 133, when we stand in unity, when there's unity and agreement, God commands His blessing. Yeah. What we already have is experienced in new ways in biblical community. And he says, he even tells us why we need the Spirit. Why do we need the, the Spirit of wisdom and revelation? Because, friends, our eyes and, and this, the marketing team of the, of, of the devil is really good. He's got a really good marketing team. Not all people in marketing work for the devil. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> you hear what I'm saying? I mean, don't go in there. But there are so many smoke and mirrors and screensavers in the world around us that things that appear as reality that are <laughs> And so Paul says, you need the spirit. I want you, I keep asking that you get the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you can know God better. Do you know that you can know God better? I can know God better. That's an incredible thing. And I love that the Bible says that we can, we'll never be able to know the full depths and riches of God. And I love that because if I could know everything about God, then he could be a construct of my limited mind. But he isn't. He's more than I could ever fathom with my mind. And so he's beyond what I can comprehend, but I can still know him better. And the biblical knowing is not an information, a rational information knowledge. Paul had this immense understanding of God. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He could recite Old Testament passages by heart. He had studied for years. He knew so much about God. Head knowledge. 
And when God knocked him off the horse, he said, who are you, Lord? Then he began to really know Jesus. And we have that same privilege that we can get to know God better. Like in a relationship, I am still learning about cursed. We've been married 17 years, almost. And I'm still learning about her. I'm still getting to know her better. And she is a finite human mortal. And it's not just trying to understand women. That's not the thing. It's just that there, is a, there are depths to people. <laughs> there are depths to people. That we just get to know each other. And we grow. And it's the same with God, friends. When that spirit of wisdom and revelation opens our eyes, we can know God better. It's not information, but it's illumination. We can grow in our knowing of God. Verse 18. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And I'll read the last two verses at the end. But I see here three things that Paul is asking for that, that we get in biblical community. And you know, we live in, a, we live in an age when we are, we are more connected than ever before. Our, our fifth appendage enables us to be more connected to people around us than, than we ever are. Technologically, you can know pretty much everything that people know. Just ask Google. And you don't even have to be able to type it. You can just like talk it into your phone. Google, what is this? Siri, how do I do that? You can phone somebody who's on the other side of the world, the time zone, and they pick up and there's no delay and they can, you can talk to them and you can see them on the phone and it's incredible. It's amazing. We are more, we are more connected technologically than ever before in the world. And yet, we are still lonely. As a society, we are lonelier than we've ever been. And that is a great shame. But the beautiful thing about what God does is He sets the lonely in families. Psalm 68 verse 6. Yeah. God puts the lonely in families. Not in an institution. Not in an organization. He puts them in families. And for us, biblical community, the overriding, overarching there's many different metaphors that are used in Scripture for the church or for God's people. But the main one is God's family, God's household. And we get to be in that family. Three things that we get to be a part of as we live out biblical community. One is it gives us hope. Verse 18, Paul says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. I think one of the worst things to do is to live without hope. Living without hope just gives us, it leads us down a path of just pure apathy. I have personally struggled with bouts of depression and anxiety over the course of my life. And I found that in those moments, the thing that helps me the most to deal with that is hope. But what is your hope placed in? Is your hope in yourself? That you'll be able to tough it out and work it out? Is your hope in your spouse? In, in your work? In your kids? In your future? In your school? Is your, where is your hope? Is your hope in your bank account? We put hope in all these weird places. But Paul is saying, I pray that this Holy Spirit enlightens the eyes of your heart so that you can see the hope to which you are called. We're all called to a hope. And the world is looking for people that have hope. The world is looking for people that are living in a way that says, I see what's going on around me. I'm not unaware of the difficulties and the trials and the troubles that we face. But I know the end of the story. We've got a cheat sheet. We know who wins at the end. I know there is a good thing coming for you. And I know how to live in a way that we can have such hope. You see, the world is basically putting up these screensavers. And what Paul is saying is he's saying, God, move the mouse. Hit any key. 
You get a screensaver on a computer screen, and that's what we see. We see this thing in our faces, this reality of, man, this is going bad, and this guy doesn't know what he's doing. And it really doesn't matter which president you've got, he's bad. The next election, the next one's going to be bad as well. And the market's going to be worse. And the petrol price is going to go up because the, it's bad. And it's, just, it's this constant thing. And, and we can so easily fall into this trap of losing hope around every... Oh man, you know how bad it is? Man, so you think you've got a bad industry? You should come to my industry. My industry is worse than yours. Lockdowns hurt us. We can, we can find all these things, reasons to lose hope. And they are valid reasons. They're not invalid. But what Paul is saying is saying, I'm asking God to move the mouse. Let's do away with the screensaver and let's see the reality of what's going on there. This hope that you are called to, may the eyes of your heart be enlightened so that you know the hope to which you have been called to. Dallas Willard puts it like this. He says, hope in the goodness of God is joy's indispensable support. Hope in the goodness of God is joy's indispensable support. We find so often that joy is centered around things that make me happy. I remember as a kid, I was, you know, they do it at school where you ask, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I was just like, happy. I want to be happy. Like one of the seven dwarfs, I want to be happy. I don't care what I do. I don't care what, I want to be. That's all I, and so much of my life surrendered, centered around me being happy. Me doing what makes me happy. And it's hollow. And it's empty. And I struggle for years. And I tried lots of different things to make me happy. But when I found true joy, man, that's when my life started to change. And that joy was in Jesus when my eyes were open to what he had done for me. And our hope is in Christ and in what he's done. That's where our faith is. Our faith and our hope is in Jesus and what he's done. And out of that place, we can live lives of joy. Then it doesn't matter what goes on around me. Because whether I have much or whether I have little, whether I'm healthy or whether I'm sick, I still know what's coming at the end. I still know the reality of where it is and I can still live out that life of joy. And that's what Paul is writing to them here from prison. And it wasn't a nice prison like we've got today. These were horrible prisons. And Paul's talking to them about hope and joy. The second thing we see that Paul says to them there, he says um, in the second half of verse 18, uh, know the hope to which he's called you? The riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. Man, it's easy. So the second thing, we, the first thing is, is hope. The second thing we get is inheritance. When we live in a biblical community, we get an inheritance. It is so easy to look around at other people's families and go, man, his dad left him such a good inheritance. It's unfair. He's got such a head start on me because he's got such a rich inheritance. And maybe some of us are self-made and we're going, man, I want to leave a good inheritance for our kids. And that's beautiful and it's right and it's true. And that's my heart. I want to leave my kids a good inheritance. But you know what the best inheritance we can leave our kids is? This. This right here. Bible says, train a child up in the ways of the Lord and he will never go far from you. It says, parents should provide for their kids 100%. But what God is saying is give your kids an inheritance that the world cannot steal. That they can never squander with bad business choices. That they can never lose because of a bull or a bear market or because of a flood or anything that goes on. Give your kids an inheritance in the community that they can never lose. And that's in a biblical community because he says there, our inheritance in his holy people. Jono, you are my inheritance, bro. That's amazing. Doreen, I am your inheritance. It's a wonderful thing, friends. Our inheritance is in the people around you. The person to your right and to your left. Have a look to your right and to your left. They are God's right inheritance left for you. <laughs> Thank you, Nathan. <laughs> Friends, there is a richness around you in true biblical community that cannot be found anywhere else. It cannot be bought and it cannot be earned. An inheritance is not something that is earned. And that's what the story of the prodigal son, if you know it, I'm not going to go into it now. One son takes his inheritance, goes off, squanders it, comes back, 
And the father welcomes him back. The older brother, who never squandered, never took his inheritance, never left, gets miffed when the other one comes back. Because the father throws him a party. What the older brother could not comprehend is that inheritance is not earned. He was still earning his father's inheritance. Okay, I've worked all these days for you. I've never asked for anything. Our inheritance in one another cannot be earned. Henry, I cannot earn you as an inheritance, but God gives you to me as an inheritance. It's a beautiful thing. You cannot earn your place in the biblical community. It is yours already. There is none like you, Dave. <laughs> Certainly Dave. <laughs> but also, friends, what this does for us, this hope and this inheritance, when we know how big our inheritance is in those around us, it gives us such an immense sense of security. We are all effectively God's trust fund babies. In Cape Town, they call them trustafarians. <laughs> They've got so much money, they don't know what to do with themselves in this trust fund. But I kind of got to live on the 150 grand a month it gives me, and I don't know how I'm going to cope with that. I've got these massive trust funds that pay out to them monthly, and they're administered by someone else. And man, it's a beautiful thing. We are, we are like those trust fund babies. We've got such a massive inheritance in one another. And it gives us such a security. The riches of His glorious inheritance. It's amazing. God's rich, glorious inheritance in each other is ours. And finally, the third thing that it gives us is incomparably great power for us who believe. Now, I am terrified when it says incomparably great power because I know that I am not able to handle incomparably great power. I do not have the character or the strength of person to handle that kind of power. None of us do. And that's the beautiful thing. Is that even though we get this power, this we and the power we get is the Holy Spirit. We get the Holy Spirit living in and with us, and it's the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead and that set Him at the throne at the right hand of God. And the beautiful, secure thing for us is that He is not far removed from us by sitting on that throne. It is in fact the place of His most involved space where He is now has authority over all things. So God is sovereign, friends. In giving us that power, God is still sovereign. He is still in control. He will not let you use it recklessly. The Holy Spirit is not a person that you can demand and tell Him what to do and make Him do things. And unfortunately, so often, we have not represented Him well in the biblical community. But that doesn't mean that He is any less God and He is any less powerful. Paul knows the situation that this, this Ephesian church is facing. Acts 19, as, as I mentioned about the story of the church in Ephesus, they end up, Paul preaches and they, they, go, they end up being a riot there. So what happens is they preach the gospel, um, Ephesus had this massive temple up above it on the city and they were worshipping this god Artemis or Diana um, and she was this image that fell from heaven apparently and she was a, effectively a goddess of fertility. And in that city they had, uh, obviously people used to make pilgrimages there and they used to come to come and worship her there. And they had lots of uh, trades people who would make these images of Artemis or Diana. And what happened is when people started hearing the gospel and believing the truth of Jesus, setting them free from the, the, those things, then they no longer bought the idols. And so the tradesmen got unhappy with that and they started this riot. And so Paul understands very well the opposition that this Ephesian church is facing. The spiritual opposition that this Ephesian church was facing. And make no mistake, you and I are in a, a battle of biblical proportions. We are in a spiritual battle of biblical proportions. You know, the easiest way to win a fight or to win a battle is to not let the enemy know that we're fighting. That you, you've got him beaten every time. If he doesn't know we're fighting, every time we're going to win. And so often that's what the enemy does with us. He lulls us into this apathy where we think, man, I'm fine. But friends, I want to say, and it's not a warning, it's a charge to say when we enter biblical community, when we commit to the community of life and God and Jesus, what you are doing is you are nailing your colors to the mask. You are sticking a flag in the ground and going, this is where I stand. And we've got to take that stand, friends. We can't live in this death of apathy in the middle ground, neither hot nor cold. 
See, some of us, we, we want to make this kind, of, uh, this kind of spiritual deal with the devil. Where we say, listen, if you, if you leave me alone and my kids, and you don't really, like, don't really come after me and my kids, I will leave you alone. I, I won't be too like, front-footed, and I'll just talk around nice things, and we'll just, I won't, maybe won't mention Jesus. We'll just say God, and we'll, you know, we'll be... But the problem with that is the devil is a liar. He's going to go, yes, 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 and then he's going to turn around and stab you in the back. Because he's a liar. Don't make that deal of apathy with the devil. No. Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father in heaven. He is sovereign. He is on the throne. None of the powers we are prone to fear can compare to Jesus. The last two verses, no. verse 22 of chapter 1 and 23 says, And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, who fills everything in every way. And just in closing, and I love how Paul does this, he starts it out with talking about God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and saying that's what it's about, that's where we start. Biblical community starts with God, and he finishes it off there. Book ends beautifully what he does in, in this biblical community, and he says, it's about Jesus. You see, we can so often join organizations that are centered around or or aimed at the same cause. Maybe we, we like a particular cause and we want to get involved in that thing. Um, maybe we, we center around a leader sometimes, a charismatic person who just really riles us up and gets us going. Maybe we, we, maybe we just love it because it's a convenient place to meet. And we're like, yeah, let's get around that. Maybe it's just a comfortable place to be, like the club. It's lacquer to be there. But it's not biblical community. See, biblical community where there is life centers around Jesus. It starts with God and finishes with God. And Paul bookends this so beautifully. His kingdom is advancing. It is his mission that we are carrying out. We are not centering around a cause or a concern or asking you to get involved with this thing that we are doing and whatever those things are. And we get involved in those things and we do those causes and concerns. We do take them on board as God leads us. But that is not what we are centered around. We are centered around Jesus. We must always be looking to Him. He is the head of the church. He fills everything. In our union with Christ, we already have a foretaste of the new creation. You and I, being joined together by Jesus, have a taste of what it's going to be like in heaven. <coughs> That's crazy. We get to live in the kingdom now of God. We get a taste of His eventual kingdom now by living with one another. We get to live lives that are full of hope, secured in our inheritance, and exercising the power of the King with all authority when we live in biblical community. And we live in a community that gives life. We have hope and inheritance and power. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you are the center, you are the beginning and the end, you are the Alpha and the Omega. Thank you that you are the one Jesus that we center ourselves around and that as we look at others help us to see them through you through your eyes help us to see one another as you see us god help us to see you in each and every person we speak to god and help each and every person who we speak to to see you in us and to hear you on our lips god i thank you that we have such a secure hope in you thank you that we have the riches of your glorious inheritance as ours in one another. And God, thank you that we have all power through the Holy Spirit available to us, that we can live lives of power and not lives of apathy and lives of discontent, God. Father, we want to ask that, and I want to pray like Paul did, I want to keep praying and keep asking, God, won't you open our eyes, send your spirit of wisdom and revelation to open the eyes of our hearts so that we can see the reality of the hope to which we are called, God. Open our eyes, Lord. Move that mouse and take that screensaver off, Jesus, so that we can see the reality of the world we live in and the reality of the hope, the inheritance, and the power that is ours in you, Jesus. God, we ask these things in your loving, mighty name. Amen. 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 Thank you, guys.